Hi everyone, in this video I will talk about vertical slice architecture in ASP.NET Core and the benefits it provides to make our code more maintainable. One of the go-to approaches to provide maintainability is to achieve separation of concerns. The traditional approach to software architecture splits the application into separate layers to achieve this, thus forming the layered architecture. Hence, with this approach we have each layer addressing simple distinct concerns. The user interface does not concern with how the business logic works or how we persist the data. Other variants, like the Onion architecture, are also based on the same layered architecture approach. If you want to learn about Onion architecture, feel free to watch my detailed video on that topic. The link will be in the description below. On the other hand, the vertical slice architecture is a technique that helps us build maintainable applications by separating the applications around features or vertical slices. In this approach, we think of the application code in terms of features rather than the layers. We treat each feature as a vertical slice. Because every feature within the application is a separate component, it can change independently. When building an application based on this approach, we consider every request as a distinct use case. We break the request into either a query or a command, and hence implement the CQRS Command Query Responsibility Segregation pattern in the application. A feature or slice covers all the layers of a traditional architecture design, and instead of coupling across a layer, we couple along the slice. The main goal is to maximize coupling in the slice while minimizing coupling between the slices. Now, let's see some of the advantages of the vertical slice architecture. With vertical slice architecture, we reduce the coupling between features. We can focus on a single slice while implementing a feature rather than different layers, thus improving maintainability. Also, every slice can have its way of interacting with external resources. We can have different slices using distinct ways to persist data without interfering with each other. Finally, we have our application code split between the reads, queries, and the writes, comments. This aggregation helps us to treat each feature as a distinct use case. Now that we know the basic theory behind this architecture, let's look at the project organization. The solution includes the data folder that contains DB context and data seeding classes. The domain folder contains all the entities and the features folder contains the vertical slices or features. Each subfolder inside the features folder is a self-contained use case. It exposed the mediator request classes segregated into commands and queries as well as the result classes of these requests. The solution uses the mediator library to implement the CQRS pattern and if you are not familiar with using Mediator with CQRS, I strongly recommend watching my videos on this topic to see how it uses queries, commands, notifications and behaviors. Both videos will be linked in the description below. Now let's cover each part of the solution. As I said, in the data folder, I simply have the DB context class and the seed class to seed some initial data, once the app starts. Nothing that much relevant to the architecture I am covering. Of course, both the DB context and the seed classes are configured inside the program class as per the usual process. On the other hand, the domain classes are the base entities on which our application is built. So let's see them both. The game model has a few simple properties and a single navigation property to the game console model. So let's see that one as well. As you can see, the same situation is here just we have a different relation to the game entity. Now, we have to pay attention to one thing. Here, the game console entity is the main entity, and the game model is the dependent entity on the game console model. This means that we can't have a game in our database that is not related to any game console. You will see why this RESTful concept is important when we reach our controllers in this solution. Now, before we get into the main part of this architecture, the features, let's just check the repository manager folder. Here you can see the iRepository manager interface, which I use to access all the different repositories from a single object. And here is the implementation of that interface. 
Here, I'm using the power of the lazy class to ensure the lazy initialization of our services. This means that our service instances are only going to be created when we access them for the first time, and not before that. This repository logic is taken from our ultimate ASP.NET Core Web API book, which you can find link in the description below. Feel free to check out the book if you want to master all the best practices to create powerful production-ready web APIs. Okay, with all the other setup done, let's look at the core of the vertical slice architecture, the features. Each feature closely resembles how a user interacts with the system. So instead of having the functionality separated by layers, the emphasis is on each separate feature being a separate component. This minimizes the coupling between features and allows them to change independently. The mediator library enables us to create simple controllers and segregate the actions into either a query or a command category. So, inside the consoles feature folder, we can see the repository folder, the requests folder, and two files, one for the controller and one for the mapper. So, let's open the controller first. Since this is a controller for the main entity, the route is only API slash consoles. Then, inside the class, you can see I'm using the iSender interface. Of course, I could have used the iMediator as well, but Mediator has split sending and publishing functionality into two sections. Thus, I can use iSender to send requests and iPublisher to publish notifications. Again, all of these are covered in my linked videos. The action is pretty straightforward, where I use the send method to send the request with the query and process the result. So, let's check the query class. Inside the requests folder, you can see the get all consoles folder, which will be the folder dedicated only to the controller's action you just saw. Inside the folder, I have everything I need to get all the consoles from the database. Query, result, and handler classes. Now, I want to mention one thing here. In some examples online, you will find all three of these in a single file. And that's not wrong. The organization of the queries, results and handlers has nothing to do with the vertical slice architecture principles, as long as they are inside the single feature folder. So if you like, you can keep them all inside a single class named get all consoles. But I prefer the organization this way. For me, it is more readable and easier to search for. My main principle is if I have a class, I will have a file for it. As you can see, this way, just by looking at the folder structure, you can see that for the console entity, I have its repository part, all the requests, in this case a single one, get all consoles, and all the resources needed for each request. Now, let's see the query class. Nothing special here, a simple query that returns a collection of console result records. Ok, so let's see the result class. Again, a simple record here. And finally, we can check the handle class. Here, I have some business logic where I inject both the repository and the mapper and use the repository to get all the consoles from the database and mapper to map the result. You can see pretty straightforward organization and flow where each feature is responsible for each request throughout our application. Now, let's quickly check the games folder. You can see a bit more folders here, but again, the structure is the same. I have a controller, mapper, repository, requests, and some other folders related to this entity. Also, inside the requests folder, you can find multiple requests. Remember that this entity is dependent on the console's entity. Well, the controller route states exactly that. This is also something you can read about in our book. This is a proper way to set up your routes for dependent entities. Now, let's check for example the put request. It accepts the console ID parameter from the main controller's route, the game ID parameter from its own route, which will be API consoles console ID games game ID, and finally a DTO from the request body. The logic inside the action is the same. I use the send method and inside the command 
to trigger my handler with all the required arguments. So let's quickly check the folder for this action. We have a command file here and the handler. And inside the handler, you can see that I first fetch the main console entity and only if I can find it, I try to fetch the game entity related to that console entity. Only then, if I find both, I use mapping and save the updated changes. Of course, all the exceptions are handled with the global exception handler and all of these cases are exceptional cases, so using exceptions is completely correct here to stop the flow. Now, if you want, feel free to use the result pattern or anything similar, your app will work the same. I tested this in so many production applications and everything runs fast and smooth because again, these are exceptional cases and we are not overusing exceptions, which is something that can slow the app. That said, we can check the command here as well. And it is a simple record that inherits from the I request interface. Great. We don't have to cover the other folders for other requests as they all follow the same pattern. So, at this point, we have the data, domain, and feature classes set up. And all we need to do to complete the application is to register AutoMapper, Mediator, and some other services in the program class. Now, once everything is done, I can run the application. And as you can see, we are navigated to Swagger. Here, we can test our API endpoints. So let's test the first get all consoles requests. And we get all three of them. Now I can test the put request, for example. And as you can see, I have to provide both IDs as parameters. And also you see the route to this action. So let's add the wrong IDs first. And just add test for both name and publisher properties. Now, when I send a request, you can see a proper problem details error response with a proper message and the status code for not found. I already have a video on problem details and how to standardize your errors in the API applications. And if you want to watch it, you can find the link in the description below. To continue, I can provide the correct console ID and send the request again. And now, as you can see, we have another error. Finally, let's add a correct game ID. And you can see a 204. So we successfully updated our entity. Well, let's simply check that. Let's provide the correct console ID here. Send the request. And there you go. We can see our updated game. Great. Now you know what is Vertical Slice architecture, its advantages, and how to implement it inside the Web API project. Also, please feel free to let me know what you think about the video and this architecture in the comment section below. With this, I will finish the video. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you again in the next one. Until then, all the best.